Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prepmatic. This week's video, I'm gonna show you how to do a finger Thor costume. So before we get started, a couple quick things. Number one, always follow local policies, procedures, and laws before performing a medical intervention. I promise you this is not covered by Good Samaritan laws. And if you start cutting on a random motorist on the side of the road, you are going to be in a world of hurt. Number two, the views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect those of my employer. And number three, I do not endorse any specific uh, piece of equipment for this video. This is just the stuff I have on hand to show you. With all of that being said, let's jump into it. A finger thoracostomy is used to relieve what's known as a tension pneumothorax. A tension pneumothorax is when one of your lungs collapses and pressure begins to build in your thoracic cavity. This pressure will eventually push over your mediastinum, collapsing your great vessels, stopping your heart, and eventually leading to death. This is a state known as obstructive shock. So the signs and symptoms of a tension pneumothorax are varied and can be very difficult to identify in the field. The patient is first going to start complaining of an increased work of breathing if they're conscious. If the patient is uh, receiving bag valve mask respirations, the person that's bagging them might start having difficulty getting that air in. If they're on a ventilator, then you're going to see an increase in their PIPs, their peak inspiratory pressures. Now, you can also start looking at mechanism. If this was chest trauma, obviously my index for suspicion for attention pneumothorax is going to be much, much higher. Now, some other symptoms are gonna be very similar to any other shock case. You're gonna see hypotension, and initially you're going to see tachycardia followed by bradycardia when they start decompensating. If you auscultate their lungs, sometimes you will hear uh, diminished lung sounds on one side of the chest. Now, from personal experience, when I had a pneumothorax, I didn't have much lung mass on one side of my body, and they could still auscultate on both sides. So you're not always going to hear diminished lung sounds on one side or another. And we all know it's going to be very hard to auscultate effectively in the back of an ambulance going to a hospital with all of that road noise. Now, one of the very late signs you're going to see is you're going to see that trachea deviating off to the side opposite of the injury. So if they have a left-sided pneumothorax, you're going to see that trachea deviating to the right. This is a very late sign and you should have intervened long before it gets to that point. Just be aware that's something you might see. So it is worth noting in a traumatic scenario, the patient is far more likely experiencing hemorrhagic shock than obstructive shock. That's not saying we're not treating a tension pneumothorax right away upon identification, but we should have it in the back of our mind. So now that the background's out of the way, let's talk about the procedure itself. A finger thoracostomy can be performed very quickly in under 20 seconds when you have enough practice in the procedure. For this procedure, we only need a couple things. First and foremost, we need appropriate PPE. That's going to be gloves and preferably some kind of face mask because it is possible for blood to spurt and get us in the face, especially if this is a hemopneumothorax. Next, we're going to need a size 10 scalpel. We're going to need a kind of curved Kelly forceps, and then we're going to need some kind of occlusive dressing. I recommend a chest seal of some kind. A vented chest seal is even better. Now, you can get packaged kits that have everything you need. This is one such kit, um, but these have a lot of stuff in them that you absolutely don't need. I don't think this is a necessity when you're performing the procedure. So let's talk about the site of this procedure. This procedure is gonna be performed at the fourth or fifth intercostal space. Now you can see right here, this is exactly where we're supposed to do it. So it kind of gives it away on this dummy. But as a rule of thumb, we don't wanna go inferior to the inframammary fold. That's kind of the crease of the breast right here. Obviously nipple line has been used for many, many years, but the problem with a nipple line placement is that nipples vary between you know, the 80 year old granny and the 25 year old bodybuilder. It's just not a very um, accurate landmark for you to use. So we don't wanna go lower than that inframammary fold. We also don't want to cut into the pectoralis major muscle. As a general rule of thumb, we've got the axillary line right here, which divides the body in half this way, and the anterior axillary line, which is right here, we wanna be somewhere in between those two sites. And like I said, the fourth or fifth um, intercostal space. So right here, right at that inframammary fold, I'm going to have the fifth intercostal space. And then obviously right above that, I'm going to have the fourth intercostal space. As a general rule, it's safer to go a little bit higher because especially in our high BMI patients, some of that body mass can actually push their gastric contents up 
into their chest a little bit higher. Obviously, we do not want to be doing a thoracostomy into these small intestines. That's going to be a bad day for everybody involved. So a couple different ways to find this site. Um, one of kind of the ditch medicine methods is to take the patient's hand, jam it up in their armpit pretty high, and then where their pinky falls is going to be around the fourth intercostal space right here. Um, and you can feel that right here on this dummy. So let's go down to the table. I'm going to demonstrate this procedure and talk through it as I go. And then I'm going to show it again in real time just to kind of drive home the simplicity of this procedure. All right, so I have my PPE on. Obviously I don't have face masks because this is a fake patient and I really hope it's not going to spurt blood at me. We have my size 10 scalpel right here, my curved Kellys. And then one thing I forgot to mention earlier is uh, have some kind of prep pad. You know, you should really clean this site before you start cutting. The reality is in the pre-hospital environment that uh, none of this is a sterile technique. There is a drape in this kit. Um, obviously, you have the time to drape and make this a sterile technique. Uh, do it. Um, but usually in the pre-hospital environment, there's nothing sterile about this. We're just going to do our best to be aseptic. So when we're starting this procedure, first thing we're going to do is identify um, the site. So right here, I can feel um, the rib that I want right here. Now, I'm going to go on the uh, inferior rib to my site. So right here is the intercostal space. Here's the rib. Underneath uh, each rib, you have this neurovascular bundle. So you wanna be really careful not to cut into that. Otherwise, you're going to have a much worse day than you were having already. I'm going to open uh, these supplies and get them ready for the procedure itself. Once again, trying to stay at least somewhat um, you know, aseptic here. And then we've got the uh, scalpel. I have my site. I'm going to wipe that site down as much as possible and make it uh, as pretty as possible. I, once again, I'm going to find the rib I'm cutting on. Now, I'm going to make an incision directly over um, that rib. I'm going to make this incision probably three to four centimeters long. Um, the literature kind of uh, changes depending on who you ask. But as a general rule of thumb, you want to go bigger rather than uh, smaller because you need enough room to get your uh, finger and your Kelly clamps into it. So now that I have that uh, incision created, I'm gonna take my finger and put it just a little ways up the Kelly clamps. This finger is just a safety to make sure I don't insert uh, too far. Now I will warn you, this uh, mannequin doesn't have a very good pleural space, so it's a little bit hard um, to get in there and actually see the pop. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in contact with that rib, I'm gonna slide over it with the clamps, and I'm going to pop into that pleural space. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do, because I need to make sure this hole is big enough for my finger, is I'm going to start doing a blunt uh, dissection. So I'm gonna take this here, and I'm going to open the Kelly clamps, and I'm gonna start pulling out. Now, different people will say different things. Sometimes they just have you pull out. I've seen docs kind of start that there, and then they'll twist it and start pulling out. You're just making that hole big enough for your finger uh, in general. Now I'm going to take the clamps out. I'm going to put my finger in and I'm going to do a sweep around on the inside of the chest. And with that, I'm trying to remove uh, adhesions and I'm also making sure I'm in the right space. If that lung is inflating, I might feel that lung tissue kind of pushing up against my finger. It's um, very spongy and obviously that's something we want to feel. Now, once this is relieved, we've hopefully heard that whoosh or the patient's hemodynamics have started to improve. Then I'm going to take my finger out and I'm going to apply some kind of occlusive dressing right here. It's a hyphen chest seal. If the patient experiences uh, this pneumothorax again, all I have to do is peel back that site get my finger and then reopen um, the finger thoracostomy. I don't necessarily have to cut again. It is, once again, really important that we're cutting on the lower rib and then moving up over that to, so we're avoiding that neurovascular bundle.
so one potential risk with this procedure, not necessarily to the patient, but to you, if they have a tension pneumothorax, chances are they also have rib fractures to go along with it. I've never heard of somebody doing this, but hypothetically there's a risk of you inserting your finger into their chest and as you're doing your sweep or puncturing down, you could cut your finger on a sharp, jagged edge of a bone. And then of course, um, you're in a very bloody environment, so that's going to be a very bad exposure for the provider uh, and potentially for the patient. So just be aware of that and be cautious. So that's all I have for this video, guys. I hope you found it useful. If you have any comments, questions, snide remarks, leave them in the comments down below, and I will see you next week.